Well, it's very nice to be here tonight. Um, you got a great, you have a big crowd. Yeah. <laughs> it's very nice. And um, I was very pleased to be invited to come speak tonight. Uh, you know, I still feel like part of this area, even though I haven't lived here for a long time. And the desert will always be my kind of place. And that's what you people have. So this, this is the book we've written, and my sister and I wrote it together. And I, I'm sorry she's not here tonight. She would have enjoyed seeing you all. Um, but it's a book that is about a family that moved to independence during the Depression, my family. It was 1935, a very cold November, and we came from North Hollywood and our friends and relatives down there called this place up north. And when my parents came up here, they called North Hollywood down below. <laughs> so it was kind of adventure. You know, this, I don't know, you probably, you probably all know when um, Highway 395 was paved, but I think it was maybe about five years earlier, um, probably about 1930. So it was a real adventure coming up here. Um, it wasn't freeway like it is now. And so we came uh, on a cold winter day and my dad had gotten a job with the city and that's why we came, it was for his job. And he was a truck driver and he was to drive a truck up through Mono Basin with uh, supplies for the uh, some extension for the uh, aqueduct up there under the Mono Craters. And at that time, Independent was kind of like a company town. The city owned many, many, many houses and could offer these house homes uh, to rent for their new employees. So we moved into a, a little house. And of course, I don't remember all of this, nor does my sister, but my mom kept a good diary and we learned quite a bit from that. And when they got here, uh, they were just really struck by the, the rugged mountains, the desert. It was so different than North Hollywood. And so they, but they thought, and she wrote in her diary that first night she was here that they had moved up here and they intended to stay two or three years and gain a lot of information about the area and learn some new things. And they didn't stay for two or three years. They lived here the rest of their lives, long lives. My father died at 96 and my mom at 91. So they really fell for this place. And we were raised with the attitude that we got to see everything, this is wonderful. They really appreciated uh, everything they saw. So, and my dad got very interested in fishing, fly fishing, and my mom got interested in the plants quite early on. But they were very busy and it took them five years to finally get over the crest of the Inyos on a pack trip. And they didn't take my sister and me, we were um, six and seven at the time and they rented a horse, two horses and a mule from um, Allie Robinson. I don't know if anybody here knew, knew Allie Robinson, but he was a packer in Independence. And he let them take these animals like uh, they don't let you do today because <laughs> uh, you know they want people to know how to take care of them. And my dad was a city boy and he didn't really know much about it. But they had a glorious time and they came back, they were gone a week and they didn't invite us to go because we had been invited to visit our aunt who lived in Levining. So they got back and started planning their next trip immediately. <laughs> and so the next trip, they went for two weeks and took one horse and two mules and, and again had just a great time. And I remember looking at the maps with my dad and I still know everything about those trips that they took even though I wasn't there and I was only six years old and seven years old. Well on the third trip, um, oh the second trip we were invited to visit our aunts 
again. And the third trip, uh, we stayed with some people across the street because we had to stay home and feed the rabbits. The war was on and people were either raising chickens or rabbits for meatless, or for, you know, for meat. And uh, so we had to stay home and feed the rabbits and water the lawn. But on the fourth trip, they took us and it just was wonderful. And we, every single family vacation after that, we went to the mountains for two weeks. So the Indians or the far beyond the Indians? Always, always the uh, Sierra. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, and everybody please ask questions as we go along. <laughs> so um, that, was, that was our vacation and we, we all just loved it. And we'd come home after two weeks and walk into the house and the floors were too smooth and the walls <laughs> echoed and it was um, a, an experience that we just loved, all of them. So in addition to that, um, they got interested in other things. My dad um, was only a truck driver for a couple of years and then he had a job in the city office in Independence and he liked that because he could come home and work in the yard after work. We lived, by then we'd moved to a different house. It was a little house on two lots and the yard was gorgeous and I always thought it was the most beautiful yard in all of Independence. The front half was lawn with big locust trees and a fish pond and there was a creek flowing through the back corner of the yard, backyard, and the backyard was all gravel and we could go out and dig holes and my dad you know, he was very fussy about his lawn, but we could dig holes in the backyard. And we were quite content. We played in the creek and all of that. And then, but we couldn't leave the yard until, um, I don't know what, eight, maybe four and five. And then we could go out the back gate, not the front, because we were on the highway, 395, and so we couldn't run out there. So we went out the back gate and we could run around in the sagebrush we could play in the creek. It was just a wonderful life. <laughs> and um, then as we got older, uh, Joanne got a bike for Christmas when she was six. So then we could take turns riding around town. So we went farther and farther on that little bike. And then eventually, and then we were running around up the creek. Our places to play were up the creek, down the creek, or out in the sagebrush. And when we could finally move farther from home, we did it on the bikes and we eventually got horses. When we were uh, young teenagers, we got a horse. And Joanne had been begging for a horse for some years and I didn't join her in that because she was considered the sensible child. I wasn't. <laughs> and so I thought she'd have a better shot at it. So. When we were 13 and 14, we got a horse, and it was a great story because um, about six months later, she had a cold. And when we heard that she was pregnant, uh, the man that was putting some horseshoes on her one day said, uh, hey, it looks like she's going to foal in a, about a week or two, and we said, what? <laughs> and I ran straight over to Allie Robinson's house. He's the guy that had bought it for who got us, got it for us. Um, uh, and I knocked on his door and I said, "Our horse is pregnant." And he said, "Oh, I suppose your dad wants his money back." And I said, "What? <laughs> Why would he want to do that?" So we then had another horse. And that colt was born in our backyard, and that was really a special thing to have, a, have your horse uh, born in your backyard. My dad was really good about making a little corral back there, and he, he always helped us with all of that. And so we had that horse, the second horse, and after it was trained, then Joanne and I could both go riding at the same time. You know, it took a couple of years. And then a couple of years later, when we, we used to leave the horse out in pasture in the wintertime because it was too cold to ride and we didn't really have time with school. And so one of these years later, um, we went out to get the horse in the spring and she had a, a little colt, a tiny little colt. And my dad said, well, that's enough. Uh, <laughs> we, we're going to, 
and, and then my sister was about ready to go off to college, so we got rid of that, of, of my horse, and, was yeah. Was horse named Silver? Is that the horse that was in? Oh, no, Silver was a mule. Oh. And one of the first trips we took to the mountains was up to Sawmill Meadows, and uh, above Division Creek. And we took, that was, that was, for Joanne and me, that was our very first trip up there. And we would go every year on the 4th of July, take about four days and go up to Sawmill Lake. And that was the old mule we always rented from Allie Robinson. His name was Silver. <laughs> and we could just do anything with Silver. I mean, we were just little kids, but he was so gentle and nice. <laughs> no, there's a picture in my book that, um, if you take a look at my book sometime, um, the other cult was in that book. Anyway, uh, we were busy doing all these things. Uh, my parents got interested in the uh, Desert Peak section of the Sierra Club during the war. And they would come up and climb uh, uh, peaks like um, Matarango, Coso, Matarango, uh, a lot of desert peaks up and down that you, you people probably know. Uh, and, uh, the peak, the peak above uh, Badwater, that one. So we did telescope. not telescope, telescope. So we did not just see our stuff. We, you know, we did the desert things too, and uh, they really liked the desert, and so did we. So all these things we were doing uh, was very exciting, and we were given a lot of freedom to do these things. And we could go out on our bikes or horses and stay all day, and we just had to be home for dinner. And once I was very late coming home from dinner when I was fairly young, and uh, my mother got a cowbell and she hung it on the back uh, porch, so she'd ring that, and I would co always come running right home. That, that really worked for me. Uh, we also did a lot of hiking just above Onion Valley, and she led uh, campfire girl trips up there, my mom did, and that was another thing we did. Um, we liked during the war because we had new kids in school and for the first time, and that was a good time for us. So in, to, in 2008, uh, we were in town and we were invited to give a talk at the Museum in Independence, Joanne and I. And uh, it was a beautiful summer August evening and there was a full moon and we showed slides and my mom had taken a lot of slides uh, all through these years. So we showed a program with slides and after that, we th and there was, there's a lot of interest in what we were talking about, you know, stories of, of, of uh, the war years and Manzanar years and all of that. So we started thinking about, hey, maybe we ought to write some stories. So we started writing stories and we didn't really discuss what we were gonna do with them or who was gonna write what. We just wrote what we wanted to write. And I wrote about the horses and Joanne wrote about tap dancing and <laughs> other things. And so finally, we had 70 stories we had written, and that's why we put it together in a book then. And this is uh, the result of a, a lot of years of fussing with it, because it takes a while to learn how to do that. But I was thinking, all of you people have lived here, and I've already heard a lot of stories just tonight I think you guys ought to be writing some memoirs about this place because you've been through a lot of different periods just like we have. So we thought that was just the most wonderful, wonderful childhood we could have had. And as in the process of writing this book, we finally figured out what it was that made it so great. And it was three things we figured. One was the time and then the place and the parenting. And the time when we got here, the depression was still on, and uh, there was hard times, and you, you didn't do a whole lot of things. And my parents, for the, their entertainment, they would 
walk a couple blocks to play um, pinnacle or bridge with their friends, and they'd take their children with them, put them to bed at that friend's house, and then carry them home. I think one of my first memories was being carried home from a bridge night when they'd been playing. And just things that didn't cost a lot. And during the war, when rationing started, um, uh, we, you know, we did so many things just locally that we, you know, we had so little gas coupons, we couldn't go down to Los Angeles to visit very much. So they stuck around and did things here, and it was just a, a, a good time of life, a slower pace, and you did things with your neighbors, and you helped each other, and part of all of that was um, then the place. And Independence was just a very friendly little town. And the schools were, we found the schools all through our school years to be really nice. Um, we had some outstanding teachers, some outstanding principals. Uh, it all was because, I think, of the size of the place. Did you have a high school there? Yeah, we had a high school. And we had about 50 kids in the high school. So we had about 12 kids per class. And during the war years, we went up a couple, two or three kids in each class. And uh, one year, we, it was so crowded that uh, the third grade that year had, had school in the church social hall. And I was in the third grade that year. And so we were up there. And it was fun, because the teacher would um, play out in the church lawn with us and you know we just we had our own little school it was like, it was like having a run, one room school for that year it was it was uh kind of special and let's see what i was going to say about the war years uh, they were very good years in the sense that people really pulled together you know people raised chickens or rabbits they had victory gardens the school kids had victory gardens and got prizes, and Joanna and I got a blue ribbon for our Swiss chard. It was very exciting. We had drives like uh, uh, silk drives. They were looking for silk, silk stockings for parachutes, and then uh, different aluminum and different things, and the kids would run around town and get all that stuff. And the Legion Hall in our town was kind of like what this place is for you people. Uh, it was an old place. Uh, when we first got there, that's where the high school kids were having their basketball. And it was just a small, it was kind of like this, only maybe a little longer. Um, and uh, we had, we had, um, what was I going to say about that? Uh, <laughs> um, I guess that's where we had our drives. Oh, and we also had school there one uh, at the same same year, they had another class up there on the stage, like your stage. So it was, um, during the war, it was a really a time where we had a lot of activity. There was big USO parties. Uh, there were enough military people that they were having uh, dances for the military guys. My mother joined the um, Junior Garden Club when she first got there. And there was also a senior garden club. I don't know what they did, but the junior gar um, garden club, uh, I wasn't in school yet when she would take me to the meetings. And I could see that they weren't gardening. They were planning parties, <laughs> parties for the soldiers and parties for other events there in the Legion Hall. That was our big place at the time. And it still is, I think. Um, And of course, Manzanar was a time during the war that wasn't so nice. You know, it was very, a very bad idea. But um, we, we didn't get involved in that. But we always noticed that when we drove to Lone Pine, it was there. And those searchlights would be going back and forth. And yeah. Uh, and, and I just, I don't want to be rude. Can I ask, how old are you? And how old were you when you moved to? <laughs> Okay, I was three. Uh, th uh, I was two. My sister was three, and now we are 
um, 85 and 86. <laughs> so so uh, we're, we're lasting pretty well. And we, uh, you know, we've uh, backpacked together uh, all these years. After, uh, after we moved away, we used to come back with our own children and go to the mountains. And I think the most recent hike I've done with her here was just not too many years ago, we hiked up to Winnedumma one day. Oh, well, we took two days, actually. <laughs> and so uh, we did a lot of, of, lot of things over the years and around here, and it uh, usually involved hiking. Well, I think I'll uh, start reading a couple stories. And you can't believe this, but of all these stories, one of the stories is about Ridgecrest. And I didn't just write it, because <laughs> I was coming here. So I'm going to read you that little story. <laughs> okay, this is entitled, The Year We Played uh, Football. For the first time in its history, Owens Valley High School had a football team. You know, uh, Lone Pine High was Lone Pine High and Big, Big Pine High and Bishop High, but for Independence, our, our school was called Owens Valley High School. And I think maybe that was because it was one of the first schools here. I don't know, but that's kind of what I thought. Anyway, I was in the eighth grade that year, but because the seventh and eighth grades were taught in the high school building, we all felt like we were in high school. The new school principal was also the boys' PE teacher. I wondered if he had visions of becoming a great football coach. Although it was a six-man team, the 11 boys from the 10th, 11th, and 12th grades were not sufficient for a scrimmage. The, fourth, the four ninth grade boys were too small to play, but all the others were drafted regardless of their interest in the sport. The mother of the brainiest boy in the high school commented, the last thing I ever expected was that my son would be needed on a football team. <laughs> Did any of you people know a Doug Elliott that used to work here at uh, the research place? He was that boy. <laughs> Sheldon Doug Elliott. Sheldon was the dad. Yeah, he was the uh, dean of the law school. And during the war, he moved his family to Independence because he was afraid the Japanese would uh, bomb Los Angeles. Is that where most of the new people in the school came from? What? Oh. Were they moving out away from the coast? I, no, I think the Elliots were the only ones that did that. Uh, the, but there are others that, uh, during the war, the um, uh, Compton, Compton Junior College taught a pilot program here. And several teachers from there moved up and were teaching, uh, the, teaching f f the, the boys to fly on the in, in the Independence Airport and they were having night classes about weather and different uh, you know, associated things uh, at night. And so that's where some of those people came from. Anyway, back to uh, the football. The playing field behind the high school was watered until there was a bit of grass among the weeds and gravel. The boys were expected to call the new principal coach, which reinforced my opinion that the football year was more for the coach than it was for the boys in the school. Our first game would be against Ridgecrest, a town about 100 miles south of Independence. The team left for the game with handsome new uniforms, black pants, and a big OV on the front of their orange shirts. They had plenty of spirit and some amount of confidence. The school bus had room for the, for the team cheerleaders, a student cheering section, and a few teachers in the band. I was the flute player. As we began the long ride, Mr. Blaisdell, the new science teacher, asked, how many of you are, can whistle loudly? A few of the statements, a few of the students could, and the rest of us were eager to learn. Perhaps hoping to enhance our cheering section, he showed us where to put our two little fingers 
uh, in a V on the end of our tongue and, sa and said, blow softly at first till you get the hang of it. By the time we had practiced all the way to Ridgecrest, we were loud. It must have been an unpleasant two hour ride for the non-whistlers. Some were trying to do their homework. When we reached Ridgecrest High, we realized right away that it was far lar a far larger school than ours. Their football field had green turf and expansive bleachers. Our home field had neither of those amenities and our busload of supporters filled a tiny portion of the visitor section. It was one of those sparkling, crisp and clear autumn days and we were bursting with enthusiasm. Our tiny band played with gusto. Then their sizable band played. We cheered and whistled when our 11 players ran onto the, onto the field in their dashing new uniforms. Then we watched in stunned silence as their 44 players ran out on the field. <laughs> it seemed like that line of tall boys in blue and silver would never end. Mr. Blaisdell, Blaisdell said in a low voice, this doesn't look good. <laughs> the game was a disaster. The ride home was silent and subdued. No one whistled. We also lost games to Big Pine, Lone Pine, and Trona. But no loss was as traumatic as the Ridge Crest debacle. Not surprisingly, Owens Valley High School's first football season was also its last for many years. That spring, the coach announced, we won't be able to have a football team next year because of an insurance problem. That might have been true. We all knew that Tom, our best player, had two false front teeth. But I always suspected the coach might have accepted a reality lesson one that the football boys had probably been aware of all along. Our school was just too small for football. Happily for the coach, we were, um, we were competitive in basketball, a sport not so dependent on numerous players. He could take pride in having a winning team composed of our indefatigable football players. He said, I believe we would all agree that our boys enjoy basketball more than football. <laughs> so that's how Ridgecrest got into my book. <laughs> Do you remember what year that was? Yes, that would have been, um, let's see, uh, da, 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 da. Uh, I was in eighth grade in 47, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, long time ago. <laughs> What? Hmm? Was your name? It was it? Oh, uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Burroughs. Oh, it was. Yeah, it was just shocking. <laughs> I don't know why we didn't anticipate that. <laughs> okay, the other uh, story I want to read is um, our last family vacation. That summer, after Joanne's graduation, we planned what we all knew might be the last family vacation with just the four of us. We all agreed that we would return to Sheep Curl Camp on Tyndall Creek, but this time we would take a different route. Um, Tyndall Creek is just over Shepherd's Pass. In late July, we backpacked in over Kearsarge Pass to Bubbs Creek and through Center Basin to Junction Pass. This route to Tyndall Creek was abandoned years ago after construction of Forester Pass, and the trail was no longer maintained. Dad and Mama had been over Junction Pass before, but it was new and dramatic, a new and dramatic country for Joanne and me. At Sheep Corral, we enjoyed the familiar views of Mount Tyndall and Diamond Mesa to the east and the Great Western Divide and the Cahuillas to the west. Each day we hiked to a favorite lake to fish. Bill walked in over Shepherd's Pass to spend the weekend with us. Bill was uh, Joanne's boyfriend at the time. Uh, he left Independence after work on Friday, even if he hadn't lost the trail in the dark. The 6,000 foot climb and 11 miles each way made it a long trip for a weekend. We expected him to arrive late Friday night. 
Joanne slept lightly, and when she saw the light in the distant in the direction of the pass, she woke Mama. I need the flashlight to go meet Bill. I can see his light coming down from the pass, she said excitedly. Mama sat up and looked toward the east. She laughed. Go back to bed, Joanne. That's the morning star. We teased Joanne about the morning star for the rest of the trip. After Bill's visit, we went on to Lake South America and over Harrison Pass, a knapsack route that, with no trail. Boulder hopping down the steep sailors was not easy with a backpack. On the trail below Lake Reflection, we met a group of fishermen on horseback. When Joanne and I stopped to chat, one of them asked, are you here by yourselves? Oh no, we replied, we're with our parents. They're not far behind us. Another question followed, do you like backpacking or do you just come along to please your parents? We looked at each other and smiled. Absolutely, we absolutely love backpacking, Joanne said. <clears throat> this is our family vacation and we've been doing this for years. I added, I'll bet your kids would like it too if you invited them. And it was amazing how often we saw men up there fishing, you know, packed in and they didn't they didn't have their kids and their wives, <laughs> and this was kind of an issue for us. Um, it was hard to explain to these men, who probably always left their wives and daughters at home, how important backpacking was to us. We treasured the early trips with horses and mules when our parents were introducing us to the Sierra. The backpacking that followed was even better because of the simplicity and freedom of living for a few days with only what we carried. How could we put into words the impact of wilderness trips on our lives when we were just beginning to be aware of it ourselves? On our last night around the campfire, we talked about our favorite trips and our favorite places in the Sierra. Dad said, I like the deep lakes like Wallace and Wales, South America and Labrador where the golden trout live. Mama was quick to say what I like best are the high granite basins and alpine flowers. My favorite flowers, of course, are sky pilot, which is a polymonium, and alpine gold, which is Holcia in Latin, that grow um, above 13,000 feet. I didn't need to think about it. My favorite thing is the view from the top of the pass or a peak. Joanne added, I have no favorite lake or flower or place. I love it all. How could I possibly choose? At the time, we valued the experiences we had with each other and the knowledge that we shared and appreciation for it all. But Joanne and I didn't know then how lucky we were to have been introduced to this sort of family vacation. And none of us knew at that that the beauty, the vastness, and the solitude of the wilderness would be embedded in our hearts and minds forever. So those are two of 70 little stories. <laughs> and we um, organized them chronologically. And we have a lot of pictures. There's 70 pictures. So that's, uh, that was it. And I, I do think that you people living here where you do for as long as some of you probably have and just hearing the story about this building uh, there's a lot of stories here <laughs> any questions yeah i was born in cartago oh <laughs> in 1927 oh my goodness oh you've got a lot to tell <laughs> and i moved to Jura when i was nine months old in 1928, and I've been there ever since. Wow. A long time. Oh. No moving around. No moving around. So you've been in Trona all that time. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Can you say a word about your mother's uh, botanical work? Okay. She, um, right away, she got interested in, she used to take us up to the courthouse, to the museum there. And she'd go in there, the museum used to be in, in the basement of the courthouse. 
and they had a collection of dried flowers and she would look at those and Joanne would say, let's go, mama. <laughs> and, but my mother would look and look and look and then she started uh, being really interested in trying to identify them. And you probably don't know of a Mark Kerr who used to live in Independence. And he was a guy that did a lot of um, historical uh, uh, stuff on the Shoshone Indians and knew a lot about plants. And so he helped her find some books to, to, that she could order. And uh, I remember she spent and it was three dollars and fifty cents on one of those big books. <laughs> you know that was a shock in those days, but she got started that way, and then she just kept working at it. And by the time that uh, you know, toward the end of her life, um, she had lots of people coming here, botanists coming looking for a certain plant, and she could go take them to where this plant was, and ha just had a lot of uh, interest in what she was doing in her plant collection, then she, she dried, she, she pressed plants, and my dad made uh, cupboards in the garage to house all these specimens. And before she died, she, uh, she gave those specimens all to a botanic garden down in Claremont, California. And it was a big collection and all very nicely identified and all of that. And of course, she wrote a lot of things about, stories about the plants and um, then later she started uh, really working on environmental issues like the water and like helping Owens Lake, mitigation for Owens uh, Lake and things like that. So she was very active in all of those things for years and years and people used to say to me, um, you know, how can she be in, in involved in suing the city of Los Angeles when, when my dad had, was working for him. Well, she didn't start that work until a little bit later, until after he had retired. But it just got to be so obvious what the city was doing in uh, pumping too much groundwater and things like that. So she worked very hard on that. She wrote a lot of things and, you know, I didn't live here anymore and I probably missed some of them. <laughs> We, Joanne and I didn't come back to live here after we went to college and uh, she, uh, she married Bill, the boyfriend, and uh, he, there's a story about him too there. <laughs> we, we called him the city boy because he uh, came up from, he went to SC and uh, he, he was interesting, there's a story about him. He, um, uh, he got very interested in duck hunting and just things he did with the guys when he came and he said he forgot all about girls. All, he had gone to school, to uh, college, two years when he came here and he wanted to work for the city and get some experience. So he uh, was here about two years and that's when Joanne and I were in high school. So he was, he was asking his, he lived in a boarding house and he was asking uh, Mrs. Pierce, Piercy, uh, who the interesting girls would be in town. And he, had, he said, well, you ought to in, look at those Decker girls. And uh, he said, high school girls? And, but uh, and then he started to date our English teacher who looked very young. And he took her skiing at Mammoth and she broke her leg. And uh, when he was there at the hospital in uh, Bishop uh, and she was filling out papers, she, he realized she was in her 40s and Bill was in his 20s. <laughs> so then he started looking at the high school girls again. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, that's who my sister married and, and uh, they never again lived here, nor did we. And uh, which was sad because our kids would always say, why can't daddy get a job in independence? <laughs> and it's kind of a hard thing to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you ever climb Mount Whitney? And if you did, how many times? Uh, I think it was four times. Yeah. And the first time was when, uh, let's see, I think I was in the seventh grade. And we had just been, we had just done the first half of the John Muir Trail that summer. So we were pretty tough. And uh, 
um, we had a friend who was a mountain climber, climbed a lot of peaks, and he was visiting us, and he said, hey, I've always wanted to climb Whitney in the moonlight. Let's go do that. So we did, and that's another story here. <laughs> it was very cold. And then um, just before I left for college, do you, any of you people know uh, Bruce and Elsie Ivy? What's the last name? Ivy, I-V-E-Y. Yeah, they had an auto parts store. I don't know whether they had one here. I, they had one in Trona for a while, yeah. Um, she grew up, she was my best friend in high school. There's stories about her in here too. <laughs> and we, we rode horseback together a lot. Well, just before I went off to college that last week, um, she and I climbed Whitney and then I've been there up there a couple times since. And Williamson. Only climbed Williamson once. There's no trail up Mount Williamson like there is up on Whitney. Yeah. Yeah. Did either you or your sister um, follow in your mother's footsteps, at, at least as an application, in an interest in botany? Uh, I, I took some botany courses, uh, several. And I married a botanist, the guy sitting in the back there. What? What? Yeah. <laughs> the, um, uh, yeah, I was interested in botany, but I, that wasn't my major. Yeah. I majored in zoology and chemistry. Yeah. Does the house you grew up in still exist? Yes, yeah. It's um, when you go in, into Independence, you pass that stone building on the, that was uh, uh, O.K. Kelly's garage at the time. And then there's a couple vacant places and then there's a motel and there's a vacant lot and then our house. Oh, I, oh is our house still there? Yeah, and it looks terrible. And I've only been in it once since we left, and um, it uh, looked fine inside, except it looked so small. Everything was miniature. <laughs> it was a little house, and we, uh, it had two bedrooms, but the bedroom Joanne and I shared had one, two, three, four, window, four, uh, four doors into it and one window. And they were tiny, and I ended up sleeping most of my life on the on the screen porch well it got glass windows <laughs> but on the on the porch very small house in a very beautiful yard and what they did to the yard where we used to have a, a fish pond and a weeping willow tree there used to be an rv parked there and it was all dirt and uh, it's looking better now somebody painted it looks good and it's 414 south edward street is the place Edwards is the main street, yeah. And at the time, uh, we had that creek running through the backyard and it had a uh, plank bridge over the creek. So for a little kid, that yard was just an enchanted place. It was in many, many trees, uh, uh, locust trees and fruit trees in the back and uh, very nice. <laughs> okay, well, it's been nice to talk to you all and I, I think you ought to get busy and write, you guys. <laughs>